Well, welcome all to this um, session. I've had a particular interest in looking at the idea of where design education is going to be headed. Working in art history more strictly, I find myself confronted in a world where the kind of art practice that contemporary art has gone down the road of has gone back to a kind of atelier style of production where more and more artists are reliant on craftspeople for the completing of their artwork. Apart from the fact that the world of art in its practice is going back to the world of craftsmanship, we will need, therefore, in art history, new rules and parameters of criticism as well, by which we are supposed to start looking at and investigating how we are supposed to even start apprehending and looking and understanding what's happening in the world of fine art, as it was called. This distinction between the worlds of craftsmanship and design on the one hand and between the world of artwork on the other, if one were to take an old-fashioned and more strict artistic, art historical view through a Marxian lens at all of this, technology really brings the two worlds together, formalism and technology, two disciplines that fell out of favor in the past 20, 30 years in art historical parlance have remained at the backbone of pedagogy in design, both understanding of formalism as well as the understanding of and grasping of technology. With the way in which art itself is now progressing, I find that we are coming back to a discourse where we need to start engaging formalistically with art using the technologies that are available to us. And technology in the 21st century is doing something new. It is creating a common platform which is being used by all artists and designers. So who then in today's climate can we call artist and who then can we call designer? It seems to be a largely self-fashioned label, depending really on the person and whether he wants to put himself or herself in one bracket versus another. And it's with that in mind that I particularly am interested in looking at what happens when we try and educate a cadre of people in a country like India in the field of design, where social development and sustainability, civilizational change, is as much a part of art for art's sake. So you have two desires, the visual apprehension of one kind of the field of art and design at one spectrum of it, and in at another spectrum, you have this mandate that design has to be able to cause a complete civilizational shift. And I'm very lucky to be able to present two speakers to you today who I think embody these two opposite spectrums. The National Institute of Design on the one hand, which has had its mandate very much in Gandhian polemics and in sustainable development for a civilization like India, embodied by its Director Pradyum Navyas on my left, and Tim Marshall, who is now provost but was um, heading Parsons School of Design until recently. So I think with these two parallel worlds, one from New York and the other from Ahmedabad, we might be able to start a discussion going. So I'm going to ask um, Tim first. Thank you so much. I might stand up if that's okay. I find it a little awkward to talk while I'm sitting. Um, hopefully this will come up. Um, so I am here to talk to you about uh, this, let me go back, the future of design education. And we have a very short amount of time for a very complex topic, so I'm going to move very quickly over this terrain. So forgive me, and it's a, a cartoon illustration of, of what is a very complex issue. But the question mark here in this statement, I think, is a very particular one. At any point in history, you could stand at a point in time and look forward and know that the future was unknowable. That's, that's kind of nothing very surprising about that. 
But I think there's a distinction at the moment uh, with design education. Design education, certainly in the West, has gone through a period in the 20th century of an almost extreme stability, where it's a, a, a form, a model of design education evolved through the arts and craft movements, the Industrial Revolution, and into the professional world that basically was uh, reified within the structures of schools and curriculum that was replicated all over the world with very little difference and, uh, and stayed relatively stable. So if you were working in the 40s, 50s, 60s looking forward, you had a fairly decent idea about how the education of the designer was going to play out over their careers and their lifetimes uh, with a fair degree of predictability. And I don't think, and I think many of us would agree, that that is the situation we're in now. Design has grown, enlarged, morphed, and changed dramatically over the last 20 years and, and is clearly going to continue to do that. Um, really starting the 80s uh, onwards, uh, design education has been transformed and changed from that early craft and guild kind of structure through the professions servicing industry uh, in the post, in the sort of service economy countries, becoming the, the designer, becoming the designer consultant, uh, and so on, has kind of we've rapidly moved through that period. But now we're in a, a, a state of I think considerable dynamism, where it's both very exciting, extremely challenging, and far more unknown in the future, because we haven't left each one of these stations behind. We still live with the crafts, we still live with the professions, and we still are working with the services. These are all swirling around, and if you look in any design school, my design school, any other, you'll find the, the evidence of all of these working together. So it's not a linear progression so much as a shifting of emphasis in different places and different times. But there's now a complete resurgence in craft, as our moderator pointed out. That's true everywhere. Certainly in New York, there's a tremendous, the handmade, understanding the provenance of products and artifacts, designers being part of the circulation and the economy through websites like Etsy and others uh, of their own production is happening on the one hand. This deep design being used as a deep localization uh, of, of craft and production and intervention. At the same time, as design is increasingly being used as a strategic process at a level that Certainly, when I started my career in design education, I had no apprehension of that it's designers and design processes now being used around issues of democracy and governance and healthcare and, and uh, disaster intervention and these incredible sustainability and the future of urbanization, these meta issues that are extremely complex. So between these two positions, we are living in a very unstable state, and I don't think we can know the kind of careers that the designer is going to have over, the, over this next generation the way we did in the past. So in this presentation, I want to use these three uh, basic frameworks to talk about design education. One needs to understand the context that you're in, uh, the particular context as well as the global context. We need to understand design, as I just spent out, what's happening in design, design profession, and what's happening in education more generally. There are what, from the regulatory and, and sort of financial frameworks and resourcing of education that has incredible impact on what we do, as well as the learning sciences and, and uh, developments in pedagogy generally. So, to go through these, context, uh, we've heard from other speakers, and I'll rely on, on the other speakers, because this is so short, to, to build off of what they've been talking about, but global urban and environment and the media networking that's going on between these dynamics uh, are clearly three dr dramatic uh, forces that are playing out on the future of design and design education. And rather than repeat what others before me have said about this, I think what we need to acknowledge is that design is implicated on both sides of the sort of positive and negative ledger, if you like, of these issues. Some of the very negative outcomes in relationship to rapid urbanization and uh, environmental crisis, design has, has been a part of producing those very negative outcomes, and we need to take responsibility for that in terms of mass consumption, energy waste, general waste of resources, and so on. While on the other hand, as I said, there's a, there's a very optimistic view that design actually, as a process, has a way to really uh, begin to approach these problems with other disciplines as, as a kind of organizing principle for how to attend to them. So what we don't want are headlines like this, and we want to move towards a more optimistic read of that, of design's uh, op work in the future. So as speakers before me have said, Adam Bly and Paul Antonelli and others, we are living in a deeply networked world, virtually networked world, where communities are spawned and growing up very locally and globally in different ways. Uh, information and data is flowing at astonishing speed and astonishing rates and amounts. 
and trying to navigate and make sense of, uh, of oneself and one's own uh, actions within this is clearly a major element of any design education. At the same time, we have physical flows of people, millions of people every year moving, moving around the planet from country into city, from escaping war and famine, moving across countries to try and find uh, you know, more, better work to provide for their families and sending remissions home. This is a massive impact on, on the way that we live and our careers are unfolding. We're constructing environments to, to deal with this. New free economic zones and new cities, most of which still, to my eyes at least, treat people as uh, widgets in an engineering system rather than human beings who are trying to live their lives in social organizations and communities and cultures and what have you. Meanwhile, in old cities, like this one in New York, uh, where I'm from, they're trying to actually rein back in some of the more brutal aspects of the, of the rational design of the city. For those that saw Karim Rashid was talking about the grid and the impact that the grid has on the way everything else follows. Here you see one of India's great exports, a yoga class going on in Times Square. We have a fantastic deputy mayor of uh, urban planning who's basically humanizing the city, going back and trying to, to sort of reintroduce a whole a level of humanity that the city has lacked uh, while it was being dominated by a more engineering perspective of how we live our lives. Designers are sort of looking at urban farming, uh, local farming, bringing the city, the country into the city, rooftop farming, vertical farming and so on. This is a group called Loop PH in London who are looking at the city as a metabolism, the resources, the wastes of city returning to, to production of food that can be then circulated in that city. So the city taking more responsibility for its own survival. Uh, is something designers have worked in. Design, I won't dwell too much because we've already touched on it, but these are the three major areas of design that I think we're operating in. Objects we know about, both material and immaterial, designers are producing them all the time. The process of design, as I said before, is becoming much more prominent and people are now, major design firms are being hired pretty much on the basis of process rather than object. And because of the impact that design is now having in the world, uh, designers and design institutions and design schools have far more agency. We're having greater impact, we're able to we have a seat at the table in terms of the changes in the world and society, in terms of healthcare and other issues like that. But with this agency we comes along much greater responsibility. We have a much greater need for an ethical understanding of our actions and the implications and consequences of what we do in the world. And we can no longer, I think as we often did in the past, defer the ethical questions around our actions to the client or to you know to the user in that way. We can't have it both ways. We can't have this level of agency and impact in the world and not take more responsibility. But relevant to this conversation, design education is not very well set up to actually address this issue of, of the ethics of the way in which design acts in the world. And it's something that a deeper connection with the humanities and social sciences, that was a reflective qualities there, right into the practice of design, into the studio, not as an adjunct, but deeply ingrained into the actual practicing of of design I think is increasingly essential. But coming back down to hard cold realities and you heard the minister in the opening remarks address this issue, most countries governments that are actually plowing a lot of money into design and design education are looking at, at this kind of dynamic and, and what you see in this graph here is the blue line is the profit margin of Apple Corporation which is running at the moment at about 30 percent and the bottom line is the profit margin for Foxconn the factories in China that make Apple products, which is running at the moment about 1.5%. So the difference between this 30% and the 1.5% is clearly what governments are looking at uh, for very good reason, that this is a very tenuous existence uh, that's, and no wonder there's so many controversies because they're right at, about the treatment of people in factories because they're on the brink of bankruptcy at any moment with that profit margin. The flip side, which is a challenge to the post-industrial world, is up there in the blue line, there's 40,000 empo people employed by Apple and there's 800,000 people employed by Foxconn. So this is producing in the West, in the post-industrial world, massive dislocation, wealth distribution, uh, distortions of a, of a major, issue, major scale, resulting in things like Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party and things you've already heard about. So there are issues and problems emerging in this global structure that we have to attend to. Now, you, we've seen Japan and Korea and China, in a sense, follow this track of cheap manufacture through to the development of indigenous brands using design and branding and marketing to get there. I don't know enough about India to start to speculate, except from what I know, what I can see, it seems a much more complicated picture where this may be a piece of what's motivating, but there's clearly 
a whole other aspect in India that uh, is where a very high end of education, technology, business innovation, what have you, these deep crafts that our moderator was talking about with these cultural roots, uh, incredible poverty and wealth uh, distribution issues and how design can work to actually help to lift up and to bring up uh, people, the, the sort of impoverished people in the world, I think is a, is a very interesting topic. Education is made up of these, these kind of infrastructure things, the regulatory environment you're living in, the infrastructure you have, and the curriculum you develop. And really the question here is how do we design design schools for the future? And I think, first of all, I want to make a, a desperate plea that we can't do what we did in the 20th century and assume that there's one model of design education. What we're dealing with here is far too distributed, there's far too many factors and dynamics going on, we cannot be all things to all people, and what we need are design schools to experiment, to iterate and make sense of their particular location and their networks, uh, and, and to experiment and, and look and observe what each other are doing and learn from that and be part of networks and not come up as we did in the 20th century with basically a cookie, cookie cutter approach. So the design school of the future is made up of people still. I think faculty are still the most critical ingredient of any school. You can have all the best resources in the world, uh, but if you don't have good faculty, it's really not for anything. And you can get away with not having great resources if you have great faculty. It's about place. I still think place is deeply important. Making sense of where you are, how it relates to the issues right in your neighborhood, right in your region, right in your country, how that is manifest in your school, in your educational programs, and then building a network from that point, a, a local network and a global network where schools with similar interests and similar motivations start to network together and learn from each other and collaborate in, in various ways. So here, and I hope you can read it, it's a bit small, but this is uh, the results, a very brief summary of a huge report that was done a few years ago about the future of the university. And I won't belabor it too much because we're running out of time, but what you have here is, is this is the language used in the report. It's a complete global study about where universities were headed. On the left-hand side, you have the traditional paradigm of academics working within disciplinary frameworks with peer review, self-referential, very individually based, working to deepen and deepen and deepen the knowledge within their narrow discipline. Uh, and what they're seeing is a trend for obvious reasons because there's no way you can actually get at the issues, the complex issues that, that we're confronting only through this disciplinary framework. No one discipline, profession, practice, community can ever hope to attend to issues of environmentalism and so on through a disciplinary framework. So there's a shifting emphasis to teamwork in the, in the academy, to, as it says here, interaction between researchers and users, to it rather being disciplinary framed, to being problem and issue based in terms of framing, using transdisciplinary networks to bring diverse knowledge sources together and various practices together to, to work on issues and uh, where the quality control is no longer just a peer review process but what the economic, social, cultural, environmental impact of that work is going to be in the future. What's interesting about this, the word design and design education was not mentioned once in this report. If you look on the traditional at university, there's no sense of having a design school in that university. There's really no place for it. But the language, and this is their language, in the right-hand one is a design language. It's a completely a design language. And so design is actually, this university, the emergent one, essentially is a design-driven and design-led university, an institution. So design has an enormous amount to offer the academy, the broader academy, in terms of trying to move the intellectual capital and resources that are locked away in these sort of disciplinary frameworks and bring them to bear on the problem we have. Uh, as well as design actually drawing enormously from the university as well. So I'm advocating for a move from the professional designer towards the citizen designer. And here's some words that I've used to, to at least give a quick outline of what I think a citizen characterizes a citizen designer uh, in their processes, in the objects they place into the world or with a gener generosity and an empathy for the people who are using them. It, it requires you to displace yourself somewhat in that process and a cosmopolitanism. And just to conclude uh, with a very specific example from the school that I'm from in, in uh, New York, New School and, and Parsons, we have a new master's degree in transdisciplinary design where we're, we've actually, the first in the US to develop a degree like this, which is actually trying to build a curriculum to, a, to, a, to go in the direction that I've been outlining, hired a fantastic faculty member, Jama Hunt, who I was hoping would be here but can't, uh, to, to develop it and lead it out. And it's a very, very successful program, one of my most popular programs. And this is his language, it's informed action in the face of uncertainty, bringing designers from all sorts of different backgrounds and non-designers together to really build the skills necessary to work on these kinds of issues. 
don't worry about the details of this. This is just a, a figurative uh, representation of what is actually a really fundamental problem right now in trying to do transdisciplinary design within a traditional university structure. The university is structured in semesters and years, and we have courses. The black, the black uh, text is all individual courses that we're all working on one project. This is representing one project to build a sustainable house and a sustainable lifestyle of the occupants in that house, uh, which is relatively you know, contained project, but quite complex issues. Took two universities, uh, Stevens College and Arrows, New School, two divisions within my university, the Urban Policy and the Design School, and all five divisions with, uh, schools within the Parsons School working on this project over three years, but it's riding over the top of this semester by semester, course by course, credit point by credit point, outcome by outcome, assessment that's traveling over these years. And basically the, the, the takeaway from this, for me at least, is this traditional infrastructure, I keep doing that, of the university, um, uh, oh, sorry about that, uh, the traditional infrastructure of the university simply does not facilitate this kind of work. And we basically need to blow it up and start again in terms of why do we teach 15 weeks in a semester, why are we always teaching courses, why are we giving credit points in the way we do, it really does not facilitate the kind of work we need to be doing. So this is my last slide, these are the methods being used within this program, you've heard a lot of speakers before me talk about uh, these issues of critical reframing rather than problem solving, systems thinking at different scales, understanding how systems work and interact, data visualization is key. I, I being able to operate across m massive scalar differences and collaboration that is absolutely key. So, sorry it's so fast, but uh, we have very short time and a lot of work and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, rather rapid fire, um, trying to look at many of the processes that are involved in what <clears throat> I've always wondered, you know, the mandate that design has taken upon itself is so much more grandiose compared to the mandate that art took upon itself. Art, after all, was only for art's sake. Design chooses to change the nature of civilization altogether. Um, it's a much more uh, grand mandate. And in countries like India, I was very pleasantly surprised to read your interview in this morning's um, newspaper in The Hindu, which talked about Pradyumna Vyas's interventions at NID and how NID is um, reframing itself and expanding. So may I please invite you to talk to us about where you think design education is going to go in India. I'll be very fast. My presentation is visual. Um, I just want to set up a background in which where we have to head for uh, design education in future. Um, if you look into that, people talk that the developing world, China and India are growing very fast. Some people say that the economies, the way it is moving, and the way if consumption happens, then we'll need four planet Earth. So I think we need to really redefine that when we are talking about developing world, personally I don't like this word, I would say talking about majority world. And we need to investigate that what should be the design model for the majority of majority world so we see that there is a sustainable development and harmonious life in the future gen for the future generation. I'll just make a context in which we need to really look into a very culture-based specific education. Morning, this thing was dealt upon, so I am not going to talk about the vastness of this country. But India, a culturally diverse nation, it's probably the only country in the world where Stone Age and Space Age coexist even today. So this is the variety uh, that you can say that the segments are very different here for whom you have to really provide design education. Very colorful, lot of festivity all around the year, which you can see, even the, the nature, certainly Indians pray nature all the time. And this is the vastness which is divided either linguistically or through the uh, rivers or mountains, the states have been divided. 
So let us look into design uh, the, the um, India, taking into different kind of India which existed in last 1,000 years. So 1,000 years, if you look into traditional India, togetherness, art, culture, and religion were very strong. Mughal India, intricacy, geometry, architecture, patronizing of handicraft, which has happened for more than five, 600 years when Mughals were here. Then colonial India, where the industrial revolution, materials process abroad, import back, architectural, mass manufacturing started during that period. And post-independent Indian economy, which is from 50 to 80, which was more of handicrafts, cottage industry, small, medium, large-scale industry, Nehruans, socialistic model, uh, the license Raj. If you have to do something, you have to take license from the government. And then contemporary globalized India, which we are living in from 1980s onward. And what is this globalized India? The open economy, joint venture, IT revolution, business process outsourcing, retail boom, which is scaling up continuously and more consumeristic thinking is also coming in. And if you divide in ethos, then you can see that there is an agrarian ethos which exists in this country and there is industrial ethos which, is, which we will be talking about. What is agrarian ethos, the family in agrarian ethos? Joint family, values, tolerance, adaptability, concern, sensitivity, togetherness, we together, we share whatever we have. Objects of veneration, object venerated, the artisans and craftsmen, creators of product, utilitarian, it's a lot of, lot of emphasis on local material, local crafts, and timeless products during this period. Human values and product values, values reflected in life cycle of products. And it's a very strong statement, but the material shapes the mind and mind shapes the product. And very strongly, the people, whoever is in the profession of working with some material has impact on their psyche. Like, it's not scientifically proven, but if Potter is looking into is a very pliable, flexible, adaptable, humble, blacksmith is rigid, specific, firm, male-dominated, carpenter, specific, not so rigid, goldsmith, precise, we were methodical, farmers, sharing type. So what is agrarian ethos? Extent, adopt, reuse, recycle, all the time looking into the meaning. But when industrial ethos started coming in, then lot many of these people who were dependent on local material, local uh, uh, market, became suddenly unemployed and started getting into the uh, uh, urban market. And they're looking into the meaning that how I can create something from West. And you see that a lot of flea markets which have come up in urban India where people are trying to create something out of the West or trying to uh, uh, change the function with the existing product. So you can see lots of things which are there in a second generation. They are not recycled, but they are mostly reused pro uh, products, one function to another function and trying, because there is a market, there are a lot of people who are still looking for some kind of products and people are creating. So these crafts people, many of them moved and creating such kind of products. You're looking for the second life, third life, fourth life of many products and there are markets which are running. Recyclability, transformation of metamorphosis from farm to material is also becoming order of the day. And industrial ethos, if you look, this another uh, um, uh, area where the post-industrial era was based on technology and ushered the new culture. Family and industrial ethos, breaking away the family systems, urban nuclear family and the values, individuality, I, me, myself started more and more for the future. The industrial ethos multiply mass production, replace, substitute, better, cheap, dispose, throw away, dispense and no use. So mass production, homogenization, rootless product, lack of human touch, quality control, explicit knowledge and automation. Imposed needs and aspired needs are growing with a lot of marketing channels. If you don't need things, you are you're given and you are uh, you're forced to take things. And that is the way we all our creative industry also surviving because more consumption, more designs, more uh, uh, profit to the company which is becoming more and more places are having the same kind of shopping areas. There is great deal of homogeneity. So globalized economy, there is some kind of cultural loss. The speed, economical, quality, competitiveness and service certainly is the thing. But the cult 
Control alter delete culture is coming. Psychological obsolescence deliberately built in the product, feeling of inadequacy, the product life cycle is shortened. So what one is really talking about, that eco-concern, energy consumption and depletion, the product imposition lacks contextual relevance. Now I'm coming to the context, which is very, very important, creates imbalance, society, family, and individuals. Now, if we really look into great deal of disposable way of life, even it leads to a human relationship, which becomes the disposable. And somewhere we need to really link between design and human relationship and how we really take. So eco-resource balance, the product creation in contextual indigeneity, social balance, family balance, and individual balance. These are some of the outcomes of the way things are happening and India being a very big country. And when we are looking into the majority world, we need to really focus more on context. Gandhiji, everybody knows about it's philosophy, and one has to really look into the need, not in the greed, and that is what all we have. Now, future focus, which we are trying to give in design education, is the context is first. Technology is always there to look into the context, and, and design is a tool by which you can fulfill the need of that context uh, using appropriate technology. The mobile, everybody knows that how much connectivity mobile has created in this country. The technology which has actually generated so many job opportunities to people, common people, and it has, um, because the India has oral tradition, that the uh, mobile became more popular than the, because we do not have so much of computing, so the internet has not become so popular in the entire country as the mobile has become popular and accepted in, in the country. There are another, things which are happening is that how really we need to create product. Uh, the Tata Swatch, which has been created by one of the NID graduate, is, is costing only, I would say, uh, $20, and it does not require electricity or it does not require any continuous flow of water. So which is looking into the nanotechnology in some kind of context and creating a product, which is the scenario where the people are endangering their lives, traveling four or five people sitting on the uh, the two-wheeler, and this is the $2,000 car which has been created by Tata's, is really taking care of those people who would like to really serve a purpose of traveling, uh, having their own um, uh, uh, vehicle. The ultra wet grinder which fulfills the need, this, these are all the work which NID graduates have done for local cuisines because it is for the Italy, South Indian dishes which uh, making a product which is well designed and well, well usable uh, uh, with modern technology. This is the Jaipur foot and I would say that the, 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 the hinge which has been developed it is uh, 10,000 rupees by while it costs something like $10,000 and how this modern technology is making people to run, walk, and how this helps people to become more independent. And this is where we are, we are talking about that even design education need to focus of this needy area which touches the life of a uh, lot of marginalized people. So NID has completed 50 years and we are looking into the direction in which we need to take design education. And this is what the model which we are trying to look into that let us look the structured part of design education uh, pedagogy and also look into the cultural and contextual part and bring it together in the classroom situation and you see that can you really engage many people in design and development activities. Now, a lot of people who are innovating at a grassroots level, somebody has sorted out with a motorcycle, a plow, it came to NID, our transportation automobile design students have worked on it and created a product of this kind, which is uh, when you want to use it as a motorcycle, when you want to use it as a plow, you can use it accordingly. The battery operated cycle, which is costing only 2,000 rupees, but the impact is very strong for many people and where lots of people who are the bicycle, bicycle users certainly can use a product like this. Uh, many such products for less abled people who have some problem is like mostly on a universal design side have been uh, developed in the classroom situation. And this is the typical classroom situation which is happening at NID and which in my view is quite unique where 
the confluence between the crafts people and students coming together trying to learn these traditional methods and giving a meaning into contemporary context where a student would take it forward and see that how he can make the product for today's uh, requirement and add value and make that person participate into the development process. So many of such products which have emerged from villages uh, given inputs from by the professional designers and range of this product. In fact, a lot of livelihood activity has happened with this design intervention in classroom. And you can see some of these products which have even gone on Australian Fashion Week in seven and eight where the, the things were made by the craftswoman. We are also now engaging ourselves with the African crafts because we feel that when majority world we are talking, certainly Asian countries, Africa, Latin America, where socioeconomic uh, uh, levels are more or less similar, concerns are similar, can we work together to provide local solutions in this context? So you can see some of the work which is happening in this direction, products. Bamboo is a future material and we are giving a lot of emphasis to develop product because bamboo can be regenerated very fast and a lot of lifestyle products are coming out. Even chandelier has been designed by a student in a classroom, you can see. And very simple cuts that how the hanger or the seating arrangement has been created uh, by students. Uh, handmade in India, one of our faculty has mammoth documentation of Indian crafts because they are just disappearing slowly and thought that it's going to be a great material for many of the students to take it forward and try and understand that how this evolution of products which has happened in the crafts can be given another boost in a, in a contemporary context. Our graduates who have also brought in, in fact, first time in the country where the designer's name has been put up, Abhijit Bansod, whose uh, work, uh, which has come from the, uh, the architectural monuments, the heritage collection, which you can see here. We have this International Center for Indian Crafts, where continuously the synergy between traditional knowledge and contemporary knowledge is happening and bringing out new uh, products. And you see that in India, um, there have been many initiatives in involving because it's a very high density of population and you have to really look into that how to give meaning to design so that can provide employment and better quality of life because somewhere the democratizing of design providing more opportunities to many people who are not so privileged that one really needs to look into and that is the focus for our design education which is coming up yes there are more than 250 uh, sectors where designers can really intervene and there are spaces available for very high end or top of the pyramid and bottom of the pyramid and a student must get exposure that if you wish to work in this developmental activity in social and economic development, there's a huge opportunity. It is not that you cannot make money over there. There's a huge opportunity which exists. And when we are talking about the inclusive growth, the design play a very crucial role for designing for masses. Thank you very much. Well, I think um, our, our time is actually up for this session, we're being told. But <clears throat> before one concludes, I think uh, a few points that really should be looked at. <coughs> India cannot be looked upon as a homogenized zone that is trapped in uh, value systems that might have been current 100 years ago. And the impact of technology and design on changing the very structures of the family system, the production technology, what happens in the village environment, is no longer left as some pure, uncontaminated space. That space is in itself a very complex space with the interactions of various forces that have been acting upon it for the past at least 100 years. And the scale of that happening is much faster. I think the other thing that's become quite clear is that globalization has 
offered to all of us a certain fundamental threat of homogenization. And that threat has turned out to be, in many ways, a chimera. That's not really a true threat, because the forces of globalization and technology have very often, we've seen, been harnessed to very individualized local needs. And by doing that, what globalization, what globalized technology has done, has actually added as a space for empowerment for the local community to actually come forward and express itself, voices of the marginalized that might never have found articulation in forums like this, are now empowered and enabled because of the technology that is available to them. So the technology need not be looked upon as a force of homogenization that is going to kill our individuality of a culture, but actually be took, taken as an enabling force. And if design education has to actually move forward in a country like India, then we are looking, we are looking at the handmade in India and all of its ethics, all those chapters in that volume, as being enabled, we're living in an age when that kind of pedagogy can be enabled and disseminated so much more easily and readily and widely via modern technology. So the mandate that design institutions in India have actually is something which is so vast, the canvas right now, because of the potential in reaching out to large numbers and communities that need to find a way of sustainable development and livelihood, which can be made accessible to them, not necessarily via the formalized semester system, but actually coming together through very innovative technology that can perhaps lead them forward. I don't know if you both had any further final comments. Just a very final comment from me that uh, there's a great Indian scholar, anthropologist, Arjun Apadurai, who used to actually be uh, a provost of the New School, which I'm doing now, who wrote on globalization exactly the way you're describing it and, and came up with this theory of scapes, ethnoscapes, mediascapes, and, and really went against the dominant theory of globalization as a force of homogenization in exactly the ways you're describing. So I just recommend Arjun Apadurai to anyone who's interested in that topic because he's, uh, I think, an incredibly good writer on, on exactly that. Well, thank you both very much, and thank you for the time that you've given us.